So this is where we stopped yesterday. Just as a reminder, we went through some of the basic uh, properties of uh, nuclei, of nuclear structure, uh, evolution of the shells uh, as you go far away from stability. We talked about exotic phenomena. Uh, and then we switched gears and we talked about astrophysics and how um, the different astrophysical processes how they take place and what kind of nuclear physics goes in them and so this is the slide where we uh, we stopped just as a reminder so we talked about the light nuclei and the various burning stages uh, of the star's evolution and that there's a lot of different reactions mainly fusion reactions happening uh, there at low energies uh, sorry low uh, masses we'll get to the energies later and then from iron and up uh, we talked about mainly neutron capture processes, that's S, uh, I, and R processes. And we saw that the main in input that we need for those is neutron capture reactions, but also, again, nuclear structure, we need better decays, we need the masses, binding energies. Uh, so all of that is information we need in order to, to describe the stellar environment, describe the energy that is released, um, and describe also the abundances of the elements that are produced in these processes. Um, and then on the proton rich side, we, uh, we saw a little bit the P process, which in reality now it's called, called the gamma process. P was the name that was a traditional name uh, that is mainly photo disintegration reactions. So the inverse is gamma P, gamma N, gamma alpha. And then finally, along the proton drip line, uh, we briefly went through the RP process saying that it does not contribute to the abundances because everything that is produced is kind of stuck on the surface of the neutron star. Um, but still there's a lot of uh, reactions going on and we do have observables, even if it's not the abundances. So we do have things that we, um, we want to reproduce. And we skipped the new P process, but if very briefly it works similar to the RP process in terms of uh, mainly proton capture reaction going up, but it, it's a process that takes place in supernovae and it does contribute to the abundances uh, to some extent. A big open question in the field is how all these processes are working together to, to produce what we see around us in different amounts and in different environments, it's different things. So this is, it's, it's a complex problem where you have to, you have your observables, you have to have accurate models of the astrophysical conditions. But then from our point of view as nuclear physicists, we need to put accurate nuclear physics input if we hope to ever understand how this complex problem works. Okay, so the goal for today is to go through a little bit more uh, the nuclear physics side of things. So I, we, we saw what is needed and now we'll go through um, in more detail, how do we connect what we observe uh, or what we measure in the lab, for example, versus what is needed for the astrophysical environment? Um, that's the first lecture. And the second lecture, we'll go through some of the techniques, uh, experimental techniques to do uh, some of these measurements. Today, we'll focus on direct measurements. So if I want to measure uh, the cross-section of a reaction that participates in one of these processes, this is how I can do it. Uh, and tomorrow we'll go to indirect approaches, which is mainly studying the nuclear structure of nuclei. So again, linking back to what we saw in the first lecture um, and how measuring the nuclear structure can uh, inform what we know about the reactions. Again. Okay, so let's get started. Nuclear reactions in stars. The main focus will be on capture reactions because these are the dominant reactions. There's of course uh, other reactions happening, but uh, we had to make a choice. So this is the focus. So let's start with a, a simple picture uh, like always, and then we'll make it more co complex as we go. So let's say we are in a stellar environment where there's only two species of nuclei. There's our Y species here and our X. And X is standing still and the Y species is actually moving with a certain velocity V um, with respect to X. So if we want to um, calculate, to estimate what is the interaction rate between those two species, that's this quantity R, reaction rate, 
then you need to know how many of species X do you have? How many of species Y do you have? What is this velocity that they're moving with respect to each other? And what is the cross section, the reaction cross section at that particular velocity? So this is um, energy or velocity dependent quantity. So you need to know that. So this is for a, a fixed uh, velocity, one, one value, of course. Uh, again, going into a more realistic situation, you would not have a single velocity in your environment. Uh, you would have a, a distribution of velocities, which I'll call um, F of U. And, and so then for every velocity, you would have a different cross section. So you have to kind of integrate over the whole thing. So you end up with a, a quantity that is it's the same quantity as before it's just that now we're integrating over all of that velocity distribution and the cross section uh, in our integral so this makes it a little bit more realistic uh, closer to the astrophysical conditions and then we can define another quantity just kind of separate things out a little bit and that quantity is that reaction rate but we're dividing by the number of nuclei so this just separates out these two parts the, the probability part of the velocities and the cross section versus uh, how many nuclei you actually have in the environment. And so this is the reaction rate per particle pair. And this is usually what we use um, as a quantity in our calculations. So let's again make it a little bit uh, more realistic. The velocity distribution we're talking about when you are in a uh, in any kind of environment, but let's say in our astrophysical environment where you have a certain temperature, T, shown here, uh, it's given by the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. It looks something like this. Um, we can translate the velocity distribution to an energy distribution. Typically, we deal with energies in instead of velocities, and it looks similar. You just do the, the simple translation. All of these uh, quantities that I'll be talking about today and in general in astrophysics, uh, at least on the nuclear physics side, these are all non-relativistic uh, quantities because the energies are actually and the velocities are actually relatively small, as you will see very soon. So this is what we, what our, uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution would look like in terms of energies. So we put that into our previous equation and it looks like this. Again, you have all the slides. You don't have to memorize any equations and stuff. We, we will just focus on the dependence. So there is a dependence on the temperature of the environment. Uh, you have the cross section as a function of energy. Um, and again, in here, you have again, the dependence on the, on the temperature. So this is the distribution of energies in the star. Now, this is not the only thing that's happening in here, of course. There's uh, another quantity that is very important, and that is called the tunneling effect. So the tunneling effect, uh, if we want to, to look at this picture where you have the, the nuclear, the potential uh, in the interaction between two nuclei, we're talking about fusion reactions, right? So you're trying to get fused two nuclei together. So when they try to get close together, they see a barrier potential. Um, and there's of, of course the main thing there, at least at large distances is the Coulomb barrier. And then when you go closer, you actually overcome the Coulomb barrier. Then we talk about the strong force when you're inside the nucleus. But the first thing they have to overcome is this Coulomb barrier. So in a classic picture, our projectile, let's say you have a projectile and a target, our projectile would never, you would never have a reaction unless the projectile would have a higher energy than the Coulomb barrier itself. If my Coulomb barrier is 5 MeV, then I better give my projectile at least 5 MeV in order to overcome that Coulomb barrier. So this is the classic picture. Of course, in quantum mechanics, we know that that is not true. So even a projectile with a, an energy less than the Coulomb barrier will still have a probability to make it through. And this is called the tunneling probability. So the probability to tunnel through the barrier and actually make it through to the other side. And this probability gets much uh, smaller and smaller and smaller as you go to lower energies uh, further away from the Coulomb barrier. So um, we, this is the second component that we need to combine. So you have the distribution of energies inside the star and you have the probability to overcome that Coulomb barrier, um, which again goes as a function of energy. So we need to put these two things together. So we'll do that on the next slide, but first I wanted to, uh, to do a little parenthesis here and talk about that cross section we saw on the previous slide. Um, 
which has two components. It has the interaction between particles, so the pure nuclear part, and then it, then it has this Coulomb barrier that we're talking about here. So if we write the cross-section, we can write the cross-section in this format, where you have the pure, um, the pure nuclear uh, part, oops, sorry. You have the pure nuclear part on one side and the pure um, uh, Coulomb part on the other side. So it goes into this uh, Sommerfeld parameter here, the Greek letter eta, where you see it's the, the charge of the nucleus, nucleus one, nucleus two, and the, the velocity between them. So we can separate those two things out. Um, and this just, uh, because the Coulomb barrier is something that we, we know quite well, the Coulomb force is something we know quite well. Um, and so if we separate it out, then we can focus more on what is uh, the nuclear part, the nuclear physics part. And this is what we call the astrophysical S factor. I will say that the S factor is something that people used a lot more in the past. I think as we move forward, we use it less and less. It's just the techniques we have available to us um, we can deal with the Coulomb barrier, even though it changes uh, so much, sorry, the Coulomb force. Um, but this is traditionally something that we have to deal with. So I'm introducing it anyway. The reason that traditionally we had this S factor there is uh, kind of a convenience thing. It's, uh, and it comes from the need for extrapolation, especially in extrapolation at a time where we didn't have the complex computers uh, to do this for us. And people had to do it maybe graphically to just get the distribution and draw a straight line. And that was their extrapolation. Um, so if I want to draw the cross section uh, as a function of energy, then it would look something like this going down as a function of energy. And that is because of that Coulomb force, that Coulomb barrier that we talked about. Um, but if I separate out the two components and now I draw the S factor, which is the pure nuclear part, you see that it's more or less flat. So if I wanted to do an extrapolation on this part, then I mean, it's, it's hard to do, this is a logarithmic scale and it's hard to do easily, again, with the techniques uh, that people had in the past. While uh, if you just had kind of a flat line here, you, um, it's easy to do. Um, and again, you know, this is, uh, you could think that you have something like this and you would think that, oh, maybe it's just a straight line and it's easy to do. And so you kind of make your guess in terms of extrapolating when in reality, it's uh, the situation, the reality is something else. Okay, so that is, uh, if you happen to run into a, a something called the S factor, this is where it comes from and this is what it is. So let's put it all together. We have again, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of energies that looks like this. So it peaks at low energies and then there's a tail going to high energies. Um, and then you have the tunneling probability, which goes up um, on high energies and then it's, uh, it's just going down at low energies. So we can, uh, there's a sweet spot right in between uh, where the two lines overlap. And this is exactly where uh, reactions that are happening in the star and the stellar environment, this is exactly where reactions would matter. If you would try to have a reaction at very high energies, there's a high chance for tunneling, but there's no, not very many nuclei that have that energy because they have to follow the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And if you go to low energies, there's a lot of nuclei with that particular energy, but they cannot tunnel through the barrier. So again, you have no result in the end. So the only region where you would have any kind of result would be right this region. And so this now has, was introduced by Gamow a while back, and it's called the Gamow peak. And this is not to scale by no means, but it's a, it's a distribution, it's a, it's a region that says that if I'm going to go and measure a particular reaction in the lab, I better measure it at this energy right here, which is called E naught, the gamma of energy. And there's also a width to the distribution. So typically we'll go and say, okay, our measurements are relevant for the particular astrophysical process if they would go from here to here. Now, this is not always the same for every process because you see there's a, a temperature here. So depending on the process you have, you need to know what is the temperature of the stellar environment where this is happening. And this will tell you what kind of uh, energies you need to go and measure. And so that, that would vary depending on um, the process. 
So we can do calculations, and this is again to give you an idea of where these uh, these measurements, what energies these measurements would be re relevant for. There is a nice, easy analytic form of calculating that gamma of window and the gamma of width. Um, that depends on the Z of the particles that are involved and the temperature of the environment. Uh, so just to give some examples, in the burning stages of the star where we had the lighter masses, uh, fusion reactions, those are uh, low temperature uh, environments. Even our sun is considered a low temperature environment. Uh, and so those reactions would be, see here is between 20 and 200 keV. These are very low energies. And this is to a large extent why it's very hard to measure some of these reactions. It's hard to go to that low energies and measure anything useful uh, because the cross sections of these low energies are very, very small. Um, the other three processes, the P process, RP and new P process are all happening at higher temperatures. So you see here is a few giga Kelvin. Uh, and so for all of these, there's some fluctuation, but for all of these, it's a few MeV, the energy. Again, compared to the energies you have here, these are very small energies. Even compared to the energies we have at FRIP, these are still very low energies. And that's why we had to, I mentioned yesterday, we had to build a whole re-accelerator facility that will get the fast beams that we produce at FRIP, slow them down, and then re-accelerate them to exactly this uh, astrophysical energy so we can do our experiments at the right under the right conditions. Uh, um, when we go to neutrons, neutrons are neutral, and so these equations won't work anymore because you don't have any Z involved. And the only barrier that you have to worry about is not quite the Coulomb barrier, but it's uh, an angular momentum barrier. And so the equivalent, it's not exactly the same, but the equivalent of a gamma of window comes from the angular momentum barrier there. And so we can, again, calculate the energies. And for neutron capture reactions, they're actually um, uh, even... Uh, lower energies. Uh, I'm seeing here that I have a typo. This is not MeV, this is actually KV. Uh, so these are all a just a few KV or tens of KV in terms of the, the neutron reactions. Okay, so let me do a little introduction here on what, you know, how to think about the different nuclear reactions that are happening at these energies. Uh, again, I know that uh, this is not the standard thing that you've been dealing with, so I'm just trying to, to introduce everything as we go. So let's say that we have a reaction that looks like this. You would have some light particle capturing on a heavier nucleus. Uh, it is a fusion reaction, so then you produce your final nucleus at some high excited state, and then it de-excites by emitting gamma ray. So these are called radiative capture reactions. So there's different um, versions of this reaction that could happen, different cases. And so we can put it here as, as a function of energy. So let's say we have our target nucleus here is A, it captures the little a nucleus, and with this capture, you, we go to some uh, excited state in the final nucleus B. If it happens that the energy that we're giving to our nucleus is exactly matching one of the levels in the final nucleus, then we would call this a resonant reaction. And I'm sure you're familiar with resonances. I don't need to explain much more. Um, there's another version where there, we give so much energy to the system that we are not in the region where we have discrete levels in our nucleus, but we are in a region higher in energy that all the discrete levels just get so, so close together that it's more or less like a continuous distribution. And we don't talk about the properties of individual levels anymore. We talk about statistical properties of the nucleus. So we talk about averages, there's a level density, there is an average spin distribution and so on. So if that happens, then you can capture your, um, uh, your particle, your nucleus, and you would populate one of these levels up here, and you would have kind of a smooth distribution as a function of energy. There is no individual level to worry about, so it's kind of a smooth distribution. And then finally, there's the case which is called the direct uh, capture, where we're again back at these lower energies, but when this capture Capture happens, uh, you're not matching exactly one of the levels, but you're somewhere in between. So this is not the case that we had here where you would you, you are capturing on 
multiple levels basically at once because of the high level density. Here, you're not really capturing on any particular level, but it's still, it's a direct reaction. It's, you see the, the products of the reaction and the available energy of that reaction going into the products. So if we want to see what this looks like in an actual measurement, it would look like this. This is an example. You can see from the quality of the picture, it's a relatively old example, but it's just a beautiful picture that has a little bit of everything in it. Um, so this is the magnesium 24 P gamma reaction. And this is the total cross section and units of micro barn uh, as a function of the proton energy. So you see how the overall the cross section goes up as a function of energy as we would expect. You see these spikes in the cross section and these are all the resonances that I was talking about. And you see different distribution of the resonances, the width will change. Uh, and this all depends on the spin of the nucleus you start from and the spin of the state that you're populating in the end. Uh, so you would have different distributions here. Um, and then finally, you have that direct capture, which would go like this. So if let's say we had no resonances at all, then this would be the cross section. It would just follow like this. So it's important to have both components in the end because your astrophysical gamma window might be, I don't know, might include maybe this resonance might go from here all the way to here. And then you need to know as a function of energy, how much, how, what the cross section is. Or it could be that the, the gamma window is right in between two resonances. So knowing exactly where the resonances are and how strong they are, these, these are the two main things that are, are important. And I'll come back to this tomorrow when we talk about indirect techniques, but sometimes we are not able to measure this directly for whatever reason, maybe the cross section is too small, maybe the beam is not available, maybe, maybe, maybe. So then if we could go and measure the location of each of these levels and the spin of the level and parity, then already we're learning something about the reaction even though we're not measuring it uh, directly. So we'll come back to this tomorrow. Um, and then to get back to this statistical region, you cannot really see it here, but as you would go higher in energy, you would start to see more and more and more resonances getting closer together, and you would again get into a smooth distribution. Okay, so that was the reaction uh, part. Let's say we want to measure that reaction. What do we do? How do we measure a capture reaction? We need to worry about the outgoing channel, right? So we populate our excited nucleus. It will de-excite emitting gamma rays. Uh, so one obvious thing that we can do is measure those gamma rays. So as we're populating our nucleus, it rains down emitting a whole bunch of gamma rays. And if we have a way to measure one or many of these gamma rays, then we can somehow get the cross section. Sometimes, again, it's not possible to do this directly, to measure all these gamma rays directly as they come out. Those come out uh, as the reaction is happening, so immediately. But maybe, again, you're in an environment where you cannot have any detectors that would detect these gamma rays uh, directly. Maybe the, um, there's too much background. There's a very high beam rate uh, that, again, creates a lot of background. So in, case, in some cases, we might want to just let all of these gamma rays cascade down to the ground state of the nucleus. And if this is a radioactive nucleus, then this would then this would also better decay. And if that half-life is appropriate, it's anything from a few, I don't know, seconds or minutes to a few years maybe, then instead of measuring all these different prompt gamma rays, we can also measure what is called the beta delayed gamma rays out of the decay of this nucleus. And again, this would give us an idea of how many nuclei B were created in the reaction. And this gives us an idea of the cross-section. So this is uh, kind of the way to think about these kind of reactions. There's different reactions happening and we want to measure the particles that are coming out. I have a, a point here that I didn't uh, talk about, which is there are other channels, competing channels that we need to worry about every time we do these reactions. Uh, there was a question yesterday, how do you do, let's say a PN versus a P, uh, what was it, an alpha P versus alpha N reaction and so on. So all these reactions have a certain probability of happening. So when my little A uh, 
captures on the big A here, then it's not only this B nucleus that is produced, but it can be many other things. So in this example, if I produce the B nucleus at a high excited state, it could shoot out neutrons and become something else. It could shoot out protons. It can do many other things. Actually, I'll take that back. Not many other things because at these lower energies, it's not very many channels that are open. It's maybe two or three channels that are open. As you go higher in energy, that's when you have a lot of different options. But for these energies, if you're at lower energies, you would only have like a P gamma reaction or N gamma reaction happening. If you go a little bit higher in energy, you might open the next channel, neutron emission, proton emission, and so on. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how these reactions work, what it is that we need to measure in the lab. Um, and just an idea quickly, we'll come back to it later, but an idea quickly of how we will go about and measure such a reaction and cross section. So there's uh, one distinction that I want to make here the, before we dive into the facilities and the experimental techniques and so on. And this is something that you might hear um, that is, excuse me, regular kinematics versus inverse kinematics. So regular kinematics is just what has traditionally been happening. Uh, and so we just call it regular because that was the, the thing that everyone did for the last 70 years. And regular kinematics means that you have a light beam, a proton or an alpha particle hitting a heavy nucleus as, as your target. So this is uh, simple. You just uh, do your reaction and then you see the products that are coming out. So I have here an example of a setup where the beam would come through all of these different elements here. These are all beam elements and it comes through. This is the final gamma ray detector. This is actually my detector. It's called sun, but uh, we'll, I, we might come back to it later. Um, and the target is sitting right at the center of sun. This is a, a large gamma ray detector. So all of these gamma rays that are coming out would be detected by this detector. So just to have a picture in mind of what the setup looks like. Inverse kinematics now is the case where for whatever reason, we cannot make the heavy nucleus be our target. It could be that it's a material that is not convenient to make a target. It's very toxic, it's a gas, it's whatever the problem is. Uh, we might not be able to make, make it as target, but most commonly it's because it's radioactive. So how are you going to make a target out of a nucleus that leaves for five seconds? So instead of doing that, then we make that, we turn that heavy nucleus uh, to be our beam. And this is again, where you need a rare isotope facility to produce this kind of beams. So now you have a heavy beam coming down the pipe and you would have now the light particle be your target. So it would be a proton, so a hydrogen target or a helium target. It becomes difficult if you want to measure neutrons and we'll come back to that tomorrow. When that happens, you have, there are disadvantages and disadvantages. So if it's a heavy beam coming down the pipe, then you start to see, you see these are tilted now, you start to have some Doppler shifts. Uh, so you have to take those into account. Um, but the advantage is that the, when the heavy beam captures a proton from this target, it doesn't really, it doesn't stop at all. It just keeps going. It doesn't change anything. If something with a mass 100 capturing a proton is not going to change very much. So it just keeps going and you have what is called a heavy recoil coming on the other side. So if that happens, we can measure that heavy recoil and uh, have another observable coming out of our reaction instead of just having the gamma rays that we had before. And so for that, you can do things like a, a dragon spectrometer. This is a triumph. There are a few of those and I'll come back to those later. But the idea is that you have the reaction happening right here. There's a gamma ray detector again. So you do detect those nice gamma rays, but then in coincidence, you would detect this heavy recoil, which goes all the way through the various electric and magnetic elements. Um, and the goal, the purpose of all of this is to separate out the heavy beam that comes through without reacting uh, from the heavy recoils that actually did react. These kind of techniques, they have to be really good. These kind of devices, they have to be really good because your beam is very similar in mass as your recoil. Um, and it's going to be much, much stronger. So the rejection um, sensitivity of these devices is something like 10 to the 15. 
So rejecting 10 to the 15 of the beam to identify the one recoil that comes down. Okay, so I just wanted to, to clarify why we need um, or what kind of different experiments you can do. This is mainly uh, with stable beams. So if you're close to stability, mainly for lighter nuclei, some, some of the heavier nuclei also close to stability, but anything that has to do with the radioactive isotope, you have to do in inverse kinematics. Okay, so experiments. Last uh, 10 minutes or so, we'll talk about the facilities that we have available, and then we I'll talk about detectors and stuff as we go through the virus techniques later. Uh, so when we do these experiments, again, you need a beam, and we define what energy we need that beam at. It was a few, up to a few MeV, not very high energy beam. So for the longest time, people used uh, stable beam facilities. Uh, and uh, as I said, now we, we're, we have available beam energies at radioactive beam facilities. And this is kind of the, the new thing, the relatively new thing in the field. So you need an accelerator. There's different kinds of accelerator accelerators. I'm not going to go through uh, the different types. It can be cyclotrons, it can be linear, it can be uh, any accelerator that uh, you want to use. There's some basic components to accelerators. This is a stable accelerator uh, example. So you need some ion sources to produce, to start with something stable that you want to accelerate. You accelerate it through your accelerator. This is a case where the accelerator is a tandem machine. So you accelerate it once coming this way, and then there's a little foil or some gas in the middle to strip out some electrons. And now because the charge is different, it gives it a second kick and it goes out this way. Um, again, the details of the accelerators don't matter, but somehow you end up with a nice accelerated beam. You have some kind of analyzing magnet to separate out based on mass and based on charge, the one, species that you want to deliver to your experiment and then it goes to, to the experiment so these kind of accelerators have been around from since i don't know the 70s there's still a lot of universities that have this kind of accelerators a smaller size stable accelerators and they have been, there have been improvements in terms of beam rate in terms of energies in terms of species that they can accelerate so these are still active there's a lot of them that are still active just to give some examples in the US, the University of Notre Dame has a, a few actually of these accelerators. Um, Florida State University has uh, some. Uh, so just to give some examples. Now with the stable beams, I think the state of the art these days or the, the, the biggest, um, uh, let's say change in the field is to go underground. And um, this is because a lot of the experiments we are doing, trying to push to lower and lower and lower energies, the cross section is so small that it, the signal that you get out, out of the cross section, out of the reaction, competes with just room background. And the room background can just be radiation coming out from the walls, uh, but it can also be cosmic rays. And the background that we get from cosmic rays tends to be a lot. And this is something that if you go underground if you, and you have four kilometers of rock above your, uh, your experimental station, then that gets rid of a lot of this cosmic ray uh, background. So this is why people started a few, I don't know, a couple of decades ago, they started to go underground and do experiments underground. And this is, I think, the first experiment that was done underground. This is at uh, Gran Sasso in, um, in Italy. This is where it is. And uh, Alex, actually, one of our organizers said that that's where he did his uh, PhD, not, not with uh, this accelerator, but that's the, the location where he did his PhD. Um, here in the US, there's a brand new accelerator that is doing a similar thing that is called Caspar. Um, and uh, you can see it over here. I don't remember, I, I wanted to look up the details and compare them, but I didn't, uh, I forgot about it to be honest. I can look it up later if you're interested. Um, but it's the first time that we have something to do these experiments here in the, the US and they, they started, uh, I think three or four years ago. So this is brand new. Okay, switching gears now to radioactive beams. So if you want to produce a radioactive beam to do these kind of experiments, there's a few different options that you can, uh, you can use. One is the option that I mentioned yesterday, which is the one that we do at EFRIP, which is called fragmentation. So you start with the fast stable beam, 
you hit a target. And then uh, out of all the things that are coming out, you need to have some kind of a separator um, to separate out the one or a few isotopes that you're interested in and deliver them to your experiment. There's another option, which is again starting, well, you will always start with a stable beam. You start with a stable beam, but you now have a light stable beam and you hit a thick, heavy target. And there's a lot of stuff produced here inside the target. And then you use, you diffuse out the isotopes, the elements that you're interested in, uh, and then just separate and accelerate them. Uh, so these are already coming out at very low energies and then you have to accelerate them at the energy you want. Uh, at Argonne National Lab, they had a, a smart idea a few, a few years back, I don't remember, maybe it's a decade since this uh, facility started, where they started with a fission source, it's a Californium source, and out of all the fission fragments that are coming out, they created the very nice uh, selection devices that allow you to separate out the different species, and again, you can do experiments with uh, very low energies, or you can accelerate them and do experiments at different energies. And then there's a lot of these low energy uh, stable beam facilities that have been developing radioactive beams, and this is just done based on some kind of reaction. Uh, whatever is convenient, as long as you can uh, select out the reaction products and again, make a new beam out of them. So there's lots of different options. I wanted to show you just, uh, again, I'm at FRIP. I want to show you a little bit more about how this works, just to give you an idea, not so much the details about the, how the machine works, but how the separation works. So I'm going to do this using an example. Um, the animation clearly didn't work very well. Um, in this example, we are starting with, our goal is to produce magnesium 40. Here's my magnesium 40. And we're starting with a calcium 48 stable beam, which is sitting right there on the chart of nuclei. So this would be what we call a primary beam. This hits the target. And then right, out, right after the target, these are all the species that are produced from the fragmentation reaction. So you see there's a lot of them and most of them are right around stability. So this is, uh, I mean, if I want to uh, isolate this magnesium 40 here, it's really hard to do any kind of experiment because my detectors would be overwhelmed by all of these high intensity species. So that's what the separator is doing here. If we go kind of halfway through the separator, then already we have rejected the largest fraction of the different species. And we're now in these more exotic species. Again, there's a lot of them. There's a lot more down here than the one that I'm interested in. So if you go all the way to the end of the separator, you end up with a nice little group of uh, magnesium 40. And uh, at these energies, we can't actually tag them one at a time, event by event. And so it doesn't really matter that there's contaminants, as long as there's not an overwhelming amount of contaminants like we had here. If it's like this, then we can do our experiment. To get an idea of uh, specifically for magnesium 40, I have here the nature paper that was published. It was from the lab. I was not involved in this. It was before my time, but it was the discovery of magnesium 40. And this was done at MSU at the previous facility, the National Superconducting Cycletron Lab. So after seven and a half days of measurement, they could see three events of magnesium 40. They're located right here. And this was enough to claim discovery. So we discovered a new isotope that has never been observed before, magnesium 40, big celebration, nature publication. This is all great. But just to see how things progress, um, a few years later, so 2015, the new facility at Riken in Japan came online and they could produce about a thousand of those magnesium 40s every day not in a week, every day they could produce a thousand of those. So then you can do a lot more. You can study the decay of magnesium 40, the half-life, the K products. So this is all great. But now with EFRIP, we can produce about 30,000 of those magnesium 40 per hour. So now you can do even more. It's not just studying magnesium 40 itself, but you can have now reactions, how it reacts with other species. And if magnesium 40 is one of the nuclear astrophysics important nuclei, I honestly don't know if that's true, but let's say if it was, then you can actually study cross sections and you can measure a lot more. You can do spectroscopy. There's a lot more you can do, but you see kind of the evolution of facilities and how and the importance of getting to the new facilities, next generation, rare isotope production, 
this is the difference. So you get within a seven, eight year period every time you get orders of magnitude more. Okay, so I will finish now with two more slides, two last slides. One is on neutron facilities. Uh, so we have facilities all over the world that will produce neutrons and there's different reactions that can be used. Um, so again, you would have to start with something stable and have a kind of reaction. Typically it's uh, protons or deuterons. You see some examples of the reactions here. Um, and then the, um, the important thing I want to highlight at this facility is that typically the energies of neutrons that are coming out are not a single, they're, they're not monoenergetic neutron, it will be a continuous spectrum of neutrons. So you have to measure the time it takes from when the beam was produced to when it makes it into your setup, and from this time of flight, you can get the velocity of the neutron beam and then their energy. So simultaneously, you can have the whole spectrum of neutron energies in your setup and measure that excitation energy, that cross-section as a function of energy simultaneously for a whole bunch of things. And then finally, there's also gamma ray beam facilities like the one at uh, Higgs here in the US, uh, where again, they produce um, sometimes kind of semi monoenergetic gamma ray beams, but this is very hard to do. It's mostly, again, uh, a more of a, a continuous distribution or a big chunk of, uh, of different energies. But again, some of the reactions I mentioned, which are gamma induced reactions, you could measure at these facilities. The problem is that you have to have a target that is either long lived or stable if you're going to shoot a gamma beam at it. Uh, so these are the things that are hard to do with radioactive nuclei. Okay, I will stop here. It's uh, just a couple of minutes uh, late, but how about we do some breakout rooms? Okay, so le let's do it in a more organized way. We had five breakout rooms. And so we will ask for one question per break breakout room, and then we can start over if we want to start over. Or if you have more questions, we can maybe continue after the second lecture when we have a little bit more time. So breakout room one. I don't know, do you guys know who was in breakout room one or do we need to tell you? I believe breakout room one was my room, but first I have a meta question. Um, how, would you like us to ask questions during your presentation? And if so, how would you like us to ask you? Yeah, during the presentation, I said it in the beginning that you can just unmute yourselves and interrupt or try raising your hand, but I'm not sure if, if it will pop up in my screen. So in that case, just... Uh, I'm guessing it probably won't because I tried raising my hand. I missed the intro when you said to uh, unmute. I apologize. Okay. So breakout room one, what was your question? Fuck. We have the names, yeah. What were the names? We will sit here and wait for the, your question. You didn't discuss anything in the breakout room? You were warned that you need to come up with a question. I have a question. Were you in breakout room one? Yeah. Okay, go for it. So I was wondering, um, you mentioned, I think, in one of your later slides about how, you know, the specific isotope was discovered maybe in like 2007 or, or mm. I, I don't remember the exact date. And you're, you showed the progression kind of how fast um, between 2007 and 2022 you're able to produce these um, isotopes. How do you, you know, convince government grants and facilities to, to build new accelerators and new facilities like this um, without the, the fear that you're going to be like outdated in three, four, five years? <laughs> That's a very good question, uh, political question. Um, well, these are all the production of these isotopes. I won't say they're well-known quantities, but we we have an idea, a pretty good idea of how much we are going to 
produce based on the reaction that we're using. So really the only thing that is needed here is a higher beam intensity coming in so you can, uh, you can produce more in the end. Um, and these projects take, I don't know, more than a decade to come together. So right now we know what are the new facilities coming online in a few years. So effort just came online. So unless we go for an uh, upgrade of effort, which will take probably another 10 years to get there, uh, this is what we have, except for maybe small improvements. Uh, but a new facility is a, a big jump, and then you can have small improvements to improve a little bit. Uh, there's one facility facility in Germany that is coming online in a few years. So we expect that they might be, I think they are going to be similar to EFRIB. It's not a next generation really thing. It's just kind of the parallel. Um, so yeah, because these are planned way ahead and it takes such a long time to, to build these facilities, you know at least a decade ahead of time what, what to expect more or less. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Breakout room two. I have another question for room number one. Uh, do you mind, Jose, leaving it for uh, for later? I want to give a chance to every room to ask a question, and then we can uh, come back uh, either be before the next lecture or after, unless it's a, yeah. a quick follow-up. Go ahead. Break our room two. Uh, so from room number two, we had like few questions, but just to ask one, I think uh, one of the questions uh, by Rutik, like, do you want me to go forward or you want to ask yourself? I think I can ask her. Yeah, sure. sure. So uh, you talked about tunneling, right? And how the tunneling uh, probability intersects with the Boltzmann distribution. But uh, tunneling as such is a quantum phenomena, yet we use a Boltzmann distribution. And then you said the velocities are pretty small as well. So why aren't we using a uh, Bose-Einstein distribution or uh, uh, this thing for me to rack. Why we're not using what? Sorry, I didn't catch the last one. Like, why aren't we considering this uh, particles which are you know moving with this velocity v as a uh, quantum gas? Why are we giving it a classical uh, explanation? Well, actually, I have I haven't seen calculations done um, in that way. Uh, and again, because the temperatures are uh, are low, I think this is a pretty good approximation. And this is uh, just to get the range. So the main purpose of this is to get the range of energies that you need to, to measure your reaction or extract theoretically your reaction cross-section. And this approximation, classical kind of approximation is good enough, I guess. I haven't seen any calculation. Maybe there are, but I haven't seen anything that looks different. Okay. So if we do uh, take the fact that tunneling happens, which is a quantum phenomena, yet we go with a classical approximation for the distribution. Again, well, if you go with the classical approximation for the tunneling side, you would get zero everywhere. Exactly. Until you yeah. hit the, maybe the Coulomb barrier is out here and then you get right. this out here. So then that will definitely not work uh, in that respect, but if, Again, it's, uh, it's, I don't know anything more to, to tell you other than this approximation for the energy distribution works for these energies and that's why we use it. But maybe uh, people use the, the quantum um, calculations, but I just, I just don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, breakout room three. Yes. Hello. Okay. Okay. Um, is it possible to create a neutron beam with enough density to study the error or the S process that we show that we see yesterday? A neutron beam with enough energy yeah. to study the S process? The, the, enough uh, density, I guess, more than energy, but yeah. So I don't know. So you're, you're getting cut, that's why I, I can't understand. Are you talking about the S process or stable nuclei or are you talking about- The uh, S, right process. S, S process. Is it possible? Yeah. So for the S process, all of those neutron captures that are happening on stable nuclei have been measured experimentally. 
So okay. you can have, you need about 20 keV energy, uh, neutron energy, and we can have neutron beams with that energy and enough density to measure the cross sections of these reactions. So these have been measured experimentally. That's why the S process is a much more well-known uh, astrophysical process because the nuclear physics that goes in it has been measured experimentally and it's very well known. So then you can tune your astrophysical models um, in a much more accurate way because you know all the nuclear physics. Uh, there's only a few reactions for the S process that are not known experimentally. And this is on radioactive nuclei, long-lived uh, nuclei that still participate in the S process but they're radioactive, so it's hard to make targets out of, or if you do, it's a, it's a more uncertain measurement. So this is the, the current research, open research in the S process is trying to measure these radioactive targets uh, with a neutron beam. And for the R process? Is it for the R process, I'll come back to it tomorrow. Uh, this is right now with the technology we have right now this is not possible to measure at the uh, to you would have to shoot a neutron beam on a radioactive beam so a two beam experiment and the yield that comes out of the reaction based on the, the beam intensities we have right now available is not enough to do these measurements directly there are a couple of smart ideas for how to do this you know 10 years down the road but right now we have no way of measuring a neutron capture on a radioactive or short-lived nucleus directly so that's where what i'm talking about tomorrow that's where all the indirect techniques come in so you can still put strong constraints even if you're not measuring the reaction directly um breakout room four yeah, when you um, switch to new kind of beam at FRIB, like a new species, what's the process that you go through to get that that beam ready? Yeah, that's uh, that's also a very good question. It's uh, it's a big difference from facilities that produce a certain beam and then then they run that for two months or or longer. So at FRIB, typically the average experiment runs for about a week, which means that every week we need to produce a, a different beam. We sometimes try to group things based on the initial primary beam we are using, uh, but typically it's a different beam every week. So the process to change is it, it starts all the way in the back uh, where the source is, and you have to use a different stable isotope in your source uh, to accelerate that different stable isotope. Uh, so that's, I think, the biggest difference. And then if I go back. Yeah, maybe I'll stay here. So you, you use a different stable isotope as your fast stable beam it goes through and gets accelerated. And then you have to tune the separator. This part is done for every time you need to tune on a different rare isotope, then you have to tune the, the separator. This part here is typically done by our operators or a stable beam accelerator operators are typically with a bachelor's in physics or similar field. So this is the, the team that uh, is in charge of the stable beam, but the radioactive beam and the separation requires techniques to know techniques in nuclear physics to do the particle identification and so on. So this is a group of PhDs uh, that are responsible for delivering the radioactive beam to the experiment. So it takes a Mm, well, FRIB is a new accelerator, so it probably takes longer for FRIB. We will get to a much faster uh, switch, but with the NSTL, the previous facility it would take a couple of days to switch from one to the other. Uh, group five. So we had a question about something that came you know, very early on when you were talking about the nuclear reactions and stars. So when you're calculating the um, reaction rate, you had um, you know, integrated over all possible velocities, mm -hmm. but how come you integrated the velocities from zero to infinity? Because well, it it, uh, this is uh, just a very, very, very simple example, right? But in, I mean, even if we look at the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, you could integrate from zero to infinity. It's just that it gets the, zero at higher energy so uh, yeah this was just a simple example whatever the the velocity distribution is then you integrate over that so it was just a 
I don't know, a simple way of getting from one place mm -hmm. to, to the next. Okay, because I, I just thought that um, you know, like it would make sense if you did that with like momentum, since that can go to infinity. I was just wondering why well, that I think, didn't go I, to like I think C still, or something like that. I think it would still work even like this because the it's the distribution, the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution does go to zero at high energies or high velocities. So even if I integrate from zero to infinity, I still get the same answer as if I would integrate from zero to, I don't know, six KT here. Um, so I think it should still work, but yeah, there it was just, um, yeah, it was just a simple, a simple step. Mm -hmm. um, okay, officially we're on a break. If uh, anyone has an urgent question and doesn't want to wait until, you know, another hour to ask their question, please go ahead. I think group one had a question. Um, and just to follow up to what Derek had just said. Okay. Uh, then uh, break? Yeah. Okay. Um, 15 minutes. So we're back. Are you, are you able to, uh, sorry, Artemis, are you able to see my question in the chat? Oh, in the chat? No, let me. I'll look. Uh, would rapidity make for a better choice, which can range up to infinity, or do we not need to consider relativistic effects? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I mentioned at some point that all of these are at such low energies or velocities that we don't typically consider re relativistic effects for these reactions. 